Hello, hello, and welcome to Hometown Daily News Show. For January 25th, 2024, it is Season 3, Episode 25. Whatever, the 24, 2024 threw me off for a second there. Today we're going to be talking about Objection. This check is too small. And this is Reality Hacking. And it's cold and flu and contamination season. This isn't a prank. You're a doofus. The science of ASMR. Target takes aim at workers buying Stanley Cups. Ancient humans ate what? How? Missouri politics are stuck in 1547. Ford Exploder... Uh, pardon me. Ford Explorers... And Ford Explorers, nearly 2 million recalled vehicles. That's a tough one. And that is why you have an experienced armor. That and more here on the set of, <clears throat> well. So I'm not sure what's actually happening, but um, I think that we're actually pretty quiet going out to the stream, not to the stream, but the recording over in the podcast is coming across quiet. So I don't know. I'm going to turn us up a little bit and um, and then uh, the, the, I'm going to listen to it. Um, later because I'm listening to it live and we've been si- sounding fine even with me turning turning it up it sounds fine anyway if it's too loud let us know um, if it's too quiet let us know if you're hearing this let us know, I don't know. Uh, the YouTube channel is growing slowly but uh, good enough for government work because you know I'm Mayor Watt and it's hometown that's hometown. Do- that's hometown.com over there. And up there is the visualizer for the sentient AI from the future. The one, the only from on high, the AI. AI. You want to say hi? Good evening, hometown citizens. Okay, we've already uh, got all 10 of our articles all ready to go. You want to get going? Sounds like a plan. My wine glass is looking at me. I hear a voice saying, drink me. Is that whining? It's wine. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Just... uh, first article. It's over at uh, Lawnard. Clerk takes Ray's into his own hands by allegedly robbing his judge. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. What the hell is wrong with people? So uh, Chris Williams over at AboveTheLaw.com put the article together. There are many things to take from clerking for a judge. An appreciation for the law. Notes. The prestige that it comes with maintaining the rule of law. What you shouldn't be taking uh, is an opportunity to allegedly commit embezzlement. A Michigan judge realized that they kept their enemies a little too close once they looked at their financial statements. Apparently from the ABA Journal, a former clerk, a court clerk in Wayne County, Michigan, has been charged with embezzling more than $60,000 from the judge for whom he worked, Stephen Allen, 42. He can't trust anybody with two first names. (laughs) Um, Of Detroit, was accused of illegally what Ill- illegally obtaining a judge's ATM card or illegally stealing How from a judge? How could you illegally do it? <laughs> yeah, that's weird. Anyway, um, illegally obtaining a judge's ATM card to make withdrawals and purchases, according to a January 23rd press release by the Michigan Department of uh, Attorney General. The author here, again, it's Chris Williams over at AboveTheLaw.com, says, uh, "Look, times are hard." <laughs> Uh, They're always my level of snarky. Uh, Even big law associates are picking up side gigs to meet their monetary goals. Yeah. Side hustles. I'm not sure a side gig is being a thief. 
embezzling yeah or embezzler yeah uh, same thing uh the answer to financial troubles is not to run a judge's pockets judges facing housing trouble is how we get clarence thomas and uh that's interesting nice jab there and uh judges with uh missing income is how we get clarence thomas's <laughs> wow so i guess at this point this is basically an effed company of uh, legal centric abuses leading to Clarence Thomas's. I guess they're not really hip to um, Clarence Thomas. Uh, considering that he's one of the judges who voted against the supremacy clause and the Supreme Court is near a historically low approval rating, we don't really need another one of those. All right. Well, this was about 50% about this uh, embezzlement and 50%. Uh, stab at Clarence Thomas and the Supreme Court, but I kind love of it unexpectedly, anyway. but yeah, it just kind of came out of left field, huh? That's okay. Let's keep going. Oh God! But you know the problem I have with this is that I didn't throw that into the chat, so I have to back up right before we get going. There you go, though. Okay, this next article is over in Reality Hacker. New Reality Labs research project demonstrates mind-bending AR capabilities. Uh, the author of this article says uh, they're about as seasoned as they get when it comes to XR, which is mixed reality or cross-reality or uh, augmented reality, however you want to say it. But um, yeah, it's, or it's, fill in the blank reality. Yeah, it's basically virtual reality of some derivative including virtual reality. <laughs> anyway, mixed reality is typically what it's referred to as. Um, sometimes it's MR, but whatever. I see a research, I see research, the author sees research papers all the time that are interesting, but ultimately one more step along a predictable path. And it's rare that they come upon as something that they've never seen even conceptually considered, but this is new reality labs research project. And this is mind bending. This is ab absolutely amazing. Um, and when I was watching the video, I had to watch it because it was a demonstration. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I could talk about this from some point of understanding. Uh, before I do though, let me throw this into the chat. There you go. Um, so Ben Lang over at road to VR.com put the article together and they say, um, in fact, it's so different that it's kind of hard to explain. And I agree. The video actually starts out. There is a video and it's over on YouTube as well. Scene responsiveness for visual tacto, sorry, visual tactile illusions in mixed reality. Okay. So researchers at Meta Reality Labs Research and University of Duisburg Essen devised a method of, for making real objects virtual so they can be interacted with in real time. And here's the amazing part of this. I, it's a five minute video. I don't want to get into all of it, but essentially what happens is you can reach for something that's represented in VR or mixed reality. And when you grab it, you grab a virtual representation of it and can move it. And the software obliterates the object from real space in your virtual field of view. So if that doesn't make sense, here's how it works. I'll even play this a little bit. So the video shows a figure, a little stubby potato head kind of a person, and it grabs a cart that's represented in real space. It virtualizes it, and then the little potato dude throws it down a flight of stairs. All of the parts that are on the cart fall off, and then the little potato dude runs into an elevator, closes the door, and the scene changes. And so when you look back where the cart used to be in real space, it's gone. And that's because the software has obliterated 
may disappear through compositing <laughs> that cart. Oh, wow. Now, if you walk over to where the cart is, it will snap back into reality so that you don't smash into it. But until you do, you have virtually changed the space. Okay, that's crazy. Isn't it? And so they do it again, and I'm gonna actually show you this one. They look at a plant and then they grab the plant and pick it up. And it becomes a symbolic representation of the plant that used to be at the end of the hallway. And, but it's your real hand grabbing it from perspective and then you drag it forward, but you can never pick it up again. Right? Not, I mean, you can, Not you might be able to pick it up space. Yeah. But watch what happens when you get close to it. It snaps back into real space so that you don't trip over it. So, and then back to the cart and there's the real cart. It's pretty amazing. And then they go on to show where there is a virtual, there is what there really is, is no chair and you go to sit down, but some, but during this time, the program has uh, composited out a chair that's actually there. And when you go to sit, the little potato head dude grabs a chair and slides it under you just in time to make it look like you are sitting on a virtual chair, but in the real world, you're actually sitting on a real chair. Okay, just the this is so weird. Yeah, the real time compositing is spectacular and there's more to this video, um, but I found it really amazing because essentially you could have room scale VR that's automated so that you can have things slide into real space and out of real space in time with doing things in virtual space so that you can perform functions or uh, go through like a, an escape room or something like that. Um, and with the holotile, you can actually walk over to something and then something slide into the room. You sit down on a couch or something like that in real space, you actually sit down in real space, but in VR space, you're sitting down on a virtual representation of what you're sitting on in real space. So it makes it hyper real and it may actually blur the line between virtual and reality to the point where you don't get in VR sickness because you're actually pegged to the real world by objects that are there exactly where you expect them to be in VR space. I thought it was a neat um, newsworthy That's a article. Big update, isn't it? To the, um, the real time compositing aspect of this, I think, is spectacular. So, but it has to be. Um, all of the compositing is intentional because you can't. You can't in real time obliterate. Uh, or obfuscate or composite out a chair that's been sitting there for 45 minutes um, without tripping over it at some point or revealing that it's there at some point. So a lot of this process has to be very, very intentional. Um, but I think it's really neat because in VR, you could play a game, for instance, in VR space where you're taking objects that are in VR and, and putting them on a table. And then when your game ends, those objects really exist because they've been put there by somebody who is like helping out with the game. And so you can make an entertainment center, right? Some VR type of experience where, um, like I said, it's an escape room, right? So they do all of this stuff in virtual space, but find prizes throughout the escape room. And the only way you get the prizes is if you bring them back to a specific table. And then when the game ends, you take your headset off. Whatever the prizes that you found in the escape room are actually sitting on the table where you put them. Because one of the, you know how when you go to an escape room, there's always somebody that's watching. Um, 
that person is like putting objects on this real world table and you take your headset off it just blows your mind that this little room actually held all of this stuff and now you have the prizes to show for your effort i really like it um, it says the authors have some surprisingly creative ideas for practical applications of this type of AR illusion, including for health. We imagine as users reaches out for a physical unhealthy chocolate bar, it morphs into something less appealing, such as a spider, which is actually kind of a dick move, but whatever. Um, or the chocolate bar grows legs, runs away, morphs into a banana while running and re at the location of a physical banana. So when you reach for it, you actually grab a banana. And it becomes a banana when you actually grab it. I mean, this is, it's a lot of fun, but I wouldn't use it for health. Um, that's just kind of a kitschy gimmick. Um, and it can mess with your mind, you know, <laughs> Turn it, turning exactly. it into a spider. Like, oh, I'm eating a banana that's a chocolate bar. Gonna traumatize somebody, turns into a spider and runs away. It's like Choo Choo Charles, you know, the spider train. Anyway, let's keep on going. Unless you want to say something about this. No, I'm just really blown away by this. Yeah. Just the real time. It says, uh, but also seem seamlessly erasing their real counterparts. This is reality hacking because it basically obliterates it from your field of view. Now it's still there physically, but unless you interact with that space, which you may or may not do, it's gone. And uh, like to your mind, cognitively, that object is gone and it'll only get better. So this is going to be neat to see actually come more to fruition. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, the next article is over in hometown daily. Some Robitussin, Robitussin, sorry, I flipped a letter there. Some Robitussin cold and flu cough syrups recalled due to potential contamination. They're being recalled by Halion, the company that makes uh, Robitussin. Um, if you've never heard of Robitussin, I guess you're healthier than I am. Um, but it's to me, it's always been known as probably some of the worst tasting medication I've ever had. But you know, but it's also one of the major brands of cough syrup in the U.S. Yeah. Yi Jin Yu over at abcnews.go.com put the article together. It says consumers are being advised to stop using the products immediately. Um, apparently, it's due to a microbial contamination, according to a consumer health company Halion on Wednesday. Eight lots of Robitussin Honey CF Max Day cough syrup in four ounce and eight ounce bottles and Robitussin Honey CF Max Night cough syrup in eight ounce bottles, all for adult use, are impacted by the recall and the recall products carry an expiration date between 2025 and 2026. Uh, the lot numbers and expirations can be found at the Food and Drug Administration website. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the URL into the chat. And I'm going to throw the Food and Drug Administration um, link to the recall into the chat. And I'll include that in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, um, you'll get the link to both of those anyway. So and they have pictures of what's going on. And uh, I don't know what they really say. Oh, they're pointing to where the lot is and stuff like that. It's basically identifying. They're, they're focusing on the identifying marks because they've already told us what's going on some microbial contamination. So you don't want to take this when you're sick because you're already immunocompromised. You might actually get something microbial <coughs> along with your bacterial infection or whatever it is that's causing you to cough. Yeah, this one looks very bad. I thought it said something about a fungal infection. Oh, really? Did I jump over that down at the bottom? Um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> including development of fungemia, the presence of fungi in the blood and disseminated fungal infection, which can be severe or life-threatening. So definitely stop. 
you don't want this. Yeah, this is bad. Huh. I wonder how much cough syrup is being removed right now. Let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in the Mobble channel. On my way to blow up the plane, teen faces huge fine after joke leads to fighter jets scrambling. In the summer of 2022, 18-year-old Edidia Verma was boarding a flight to Spain at London's Gatwick Airport when he sent a message to a friend on Snapchat on my way to blow up a plane. I'm a member of the Taliban. As you might expect, the message was a joke. Unfortunately, no. Um, Lucas Ropek over at gizmodo.com put the article together. The kid happened to be using the airport's Wi-Fi network when he sent it, and they do deep packet inspection, so they saw what was being sent. Several hours later, when Verma deplaned at his destination, he was arrested and drummed into a prison cell by local police, which, by the way, is after the fact. Right, so <laughs> luckily this was not legitimate. <laughs> he would stay there for two days before being finally released on bail. As it turns out, Verma's Snapchat message had been intercepted by British security forces who reported his comment to Spanish authorities. Spain subsequently scrambled two F-18s, which escorted the plane Verma was on until it reached its destination, which is really dumb. Why would you scramble jets if you're the, you know the intent is to blow it up? What are you going to do? Blow it up? Right, and why would you let the plane leave? Maybe they didn't get the message in time. Yeah, why not turn it around? Whatever. But all, all of this is reactive and extraordinarily reactive, you know? Hey, there's somebody on this plane. Let's go and send two F-18 fighter jets. They didn't say, hey, I'm going to go and land this somewhere. Like a report that said hey, we're going to fly two planes into the World Trade Center. There was a report before that happened and nobody moved on it. This is actually some doofus sending a Snapchat because, you know, that's what people do. And then they just sent it out like they sent two F-18 fighter jets after the intercept. And, and instead of turning the plane around and landing it or otherwise, they actually scrambled two jets. It's all, it just seems stupid. Burma's lawyer has defended him by noting the team didn't put his message on Facebook or advertise it. And that the message was sent was the equivalent of making a joke inside a car with friends. I agree, but it's stupid. By the way, this is the Streisand effect because Nobody knew about it except this stupid kid and his friends because they do dip, deep packet inspection on the network. They saw the text message and amplified it into F-18 fighter jets being sent out. And then whatever quarantining efforts they did when the plane landed, sequestration, you know, stopping it from actually being close to any other human habitation. <sighs> It's dumb. Um, so he it's may now have to pay. It's interesting too because it was because he was on the airport's Wi-Fi. So if he had not been, I guess they wouldn't have caught him. Which Correct. Is kind of concerning, but. Correct. It was British intelligence that told Spanish authorities, and Spanish authorities jumped, and they shouldn't have. They should have just. I mean, if you're. If you're not intent in taking the plane out, what are you going to do? The F-18 witnessed the plane blowing up? That doesn't do any or good. Or be involved in the explosion. Yeah. I mean, it's just dumb. So, yeah, it was amplified by the, the people with good intent, but bad actors. I mean, it's just poor execution. So, but if you must, don't do it on an electronic device if you're going to be a dumbass. If you insist, don't do it on an electronic device at an airport. And if you really, really can't help yourself, never, ever make a joke on an electronic device on the airport's public Wi-Fi network. Yeah, because just so you know, folks, if 
you use somebody else's Wi-Fi, including public Wi-Fi, even if it's encrypted, they're the ones with the keys. So they can unlock all of your encrypted anything, unless you're on a VPN and the, the public Wi-Fi may boot VPN, may, may block VPN. It's rare, but um, I've been on many that block VPN. Anyway, how about don't be a dumbass and say I'm on my way to blow up a plane? That well, yeah, I mean, it's probably not going to go over real well in most places, but it's really not going to go well at an airport. Yeah, I can't even make these kind of jokes in any circles because if I ever get on a plane, I'm going to have a body cavity check, you know? <clears throat> Let's keep going. I'm going to have an F-18 flying up my colon trying to find out if I've talked about this story yeah hey uh so the next article is over in technology today the science behind asmr first of its kind research sheds new light so i guess all of those streamers on twitch and elsewhere they were actually doing fundamental research pushing the envelope of psychology is it sociology sex ed biology microbiology and we don't know because i think to date nobody's really thought there was much science to it um I, I think people actually bought into uh asmr but research it no no i don't know researchers at rural university bochum um have uh conducted the first systematic review of autonomous sensory meridian response or asmr Oh, God. <laughs> uh, that has to be computer generated, right? Those fingers don't look real, but I don't want to put that, anybody down. Be, uh, AI. <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to hand shame anybody. Anyway, uh, Roar University Bochum is the uh, author of the article over at SciTechDaily.com. Yeah, I was going to say, are you going to do some ASMR there? <laughs> hey, look. I'm an ASMR hand microphone model. They make special microphones that are actually in the shape of ears. So that you can get the stereo effect of ASMR. Oh, okay. And they're pretty expensive. And in, and in reality, I think one person did it, like was given one of these things. And then all of the other ASMRs, A ASMR rights, ASMR not rights. Anyway, um, they jumped on board too. Like, I think one of these ear um, mics are like uh, $2,000 or something like that. Oh, anyway. Wow. Millions of individuals tune into YouTube and various social media platforms like TikTok, where content creators engage audiences by whispering, calming phrases, performing simulated roles like a hair salon visit, or interacting with items like computer keyboards in a rhythmic manner. I want a mode keyboard, by the way. They sound so good. Anyway, about 25 to 30 percent of viewers experience the uh, ASMR associated with well-being, a characteristic tingling sensation on the scalp and neck. Tobias Lohaus of Rohr University, Bochum, Germany, uh, told uh, together with Professor Patricia Toma uh, from Rohr University and Professor Silja Bellingrath from University of Duisburg, Essen. Um, published the first systemic uh, systematic review on the topic i guess it's this is pretty neat um but to find out why asmr really is what it is the researcher screened more than 1000 articles filtered out 54 on the subject of asmr that had been previously published in a scientific journal after peer review by independent experts and we worked out that ASMR is a clearly outlined phenomenon that is experienced and described by many people in a very similar way, says Tobias Lohaus. Experienced viewers of ASMR content also don't seem to be guided by expectancy effects, 
So expectancy effects are kind of in the name. Um, if I sit there and say, when you uh, eat tomato soup, you're going to get the taste of tomato and pepper and um, kind of a, a, a tart taste and then a, a lingering um, kind of sour aftertaste uh, of onions and other and garlic, right? If I say all of that, then people who find out about tomato soup later and hear about this from me by, via recording or word of mouth, they expect those effects, literally. So specifically right, so for it the might cause the effects, right? Correct. And it's tainting the sample. Um, and uh, that kind of bias actually shows up when um, experimenters are watching the uh, people being experimented on their behavior changes and um, it's all over pretty much a bad thing so um, specifically for roughly 25 to 30 percent of people who experience ASMR several studies showed that watching ASMR videos was associated with short-term positive effects regarding their mood as well as physiological changes such as lower heartbeat and lower blood pressure so to me that's kind of like the uh, like runner's high right you just kind of get into the zone and you detach from whatever pressures might be impacting you and um, i wonder but, if the um same effect would be found in watching something like a favorite show interesting yeah so um they even do eeg studies i don't know I think I'm willing to bet that it, if it's anything that helps you relax, then you're going to see that effect regardless of what it is. It doesn't have to be ASMR. It just seems to be, I don't know. I think there might be a charisma aspect of this. So if the person that's doing the ASMR presentation is charismatic, you know, has a pleasant voice, appearance, demeanor. I think that people have no problem with listening to the ASMR. So perhaps precisely uh, those states of consciousness that occur in a relaxed state, fMRI studies have repeatedly shown that among other things, very specific brain areas are involved in the ASMR experience, particularly the anterior cingulate gyrus, which is related to attentional processes as well as brain regions related to movement. So you're processing the movement of the sounds. Um, and then you are literally paying attention to the movement of the sounds and that calms you. So, so now there's a, a study on long-term effects is in the pipeline, um, which is pretty much what needs to be done at this point. Um, what are the long-term effects and, and what are go into what I would like is greater fidelity now, which is kind of funny for ASMR fidelity of the sound. Um, so like, what is it that, what types of ASMR are there that actually, are they calming or is there something else? Maybe something there's titillating about it. And, um, what, what the predominant number is, is calming, relaxing but not all of it is like that. Right. Um, so right, some of it might be aggravating to the person, depending on if they like the sound. Yeah. You know, like eating and stuff like that drives a lot of people nuts. I can't remember the name of that. It's a, it's not really a phobia. It's just a, <clears throat> a disgust response hearing somebody chew. Uh, what is that called? I don't remember. Uh, misophonia. Yeah, misophonia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. misophonia. I yeah. might not be pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, um, miso. Yeah, misophonia. Uh, you don't like the sound of people chewing. In fact, it kind of enrages me, uh, for the most part. Um, but I'm trying to remedy that. Um, I'm not even sure why. It just is. Anyway, pretty neat. Um, article and the, but they've published, see the thing is that they go, it's the first research study, uh, first of its kind of research sheds new light, but they actually talk about 54 papers that were published around ASMR. Um, 
So I don't know. Doesn't seem right, like it's so the there's definitely time. been, but are those actual studies <laughs> or are those just literature review or other things? Like are they actually running an experiment? Yeah, no, I'm gonna have to go and look, right? No, I'm not. That's okay. Let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in hometown daily seven target workers fired after buying stanley cups say they were caught off guard by the crackdown i think it's a stupid crackdown except depending on the scope like if they bought 15 of them and there were only 16 and somebody else bought the 16th one and they work there then no customers got it at all and it's only because it was insider information that they were ever even present um and it's kind of like nepotism, right? Like, which really is disgusting and I hate it. You're the only reason you get what you get is because you're buddies with somebody. Um, Target fired workers this month after they purchased special edition Stanley mugs. Seven workers said the managers told them that they violated a company policy for employee purchases. Some said they weren't aware of the policy details and other said that they tried to follow the rules. I think it's kind of dumb, but. Oh, before I get into that article, let me throw it into the chat. You know, if you're a target worker, you can't have anything nice. Oh, no, you have to. You have to make your minimum wage and and uh, leave. In fact, I think Target would probably say behind closed doors. Wait, you can afford a Stanley mug. We're paying you too much. Dominic Reuter over at businessinsider.com put the article together. That's not a quote. I'm just, that is that, uh, I guess we're not going to get target as a, uh, as an advertiser. Um, now we're running out of sponsors here. Yeah. Our sponsor list is getting precariously small. Eh, we'll just have to wait until we're making that streamer money, you know? Even yeah, while Twitch keeps making changes to its streamer uh, revenue policy. Uh, I can go topless now, right? No? Oh. Uh, every workday for the past two years, Catherine Carter would arrive at 3.30 a.m. at her Target store near Miami, where she would lead her team in preparing five departments to sell all sorts of products. She worked the overnight shift for three years before that. She said in all her 19 years at Target, She'd never been written up, never called out, never been late. On January 3rd, she stopped by her store's Starbucks cafe while on break, where a barista asked whether she wanted to buy one of the exclusive Starbucks by Stanley Cups. My mama passed from breast cancer, so I always try to get as much pink as I can, she told Business Insider, adding that her managers were present during the transaction and raised no objection. Okay, she, that is so ridiculous. She was terminated. She didn't even prompt the uh, purchase. Yeah. Carter is one of... Uh, she was uh, terminated the following week thanks to that pink stainless steel insulated cup which retailed for 50 bucks. So, seven others um, told BI, that business insider, that the store leaders, including human resources and asset protection representatives, cited company policy that prohibits employees from using their position to gain an unfair advantage over guests in order to purchase merchandise. All of the employees' identi- uh, identities and employment statuses were verified. So the rule especially concerns high demand or limited stock items, such as Pokemon cards and PlayStation. But none of the seven workers could recall a situation where in which a peer in their store was terminated. So it seems pretty subjective, you know, and all of a sudden they come, uh, it's disparate treatment. Uh, over time and coming down hard on somebody in a vacuum is really an HR issue that should have been preceded by weeks of notice. And this is what has happened in, in places where I've worked that were retail Um, warnings, notices really to the employees. Hey, we're trying to make our business more successful by having traffic from outside come in and buy stuff, not just selling it to us via garage sale. Um, so three said that they were offered, they offered to return uh, the cup when they were informed of the problem. Their offers were declined. Of course, they're not going to take them back. Um, right, they didn't really care about the cup. And yeah, and they wanted 
somebody to be sacrificed. You know, this is what's going to happen if you violate a policy that really is in the dark. Um, I don't know. They could probably sue um, for wrongful termination because it's disparate treatment. Nobody has ever been fired for this. Exactly. And it sounds like other people have done things like this. And I really do think there's a difference. Somebody buying out like an entire shelf of the products they're working overnight or something versus somebody buying one cup. One Starbucks team lead in Maryland never even bought a cup, but was terminated because they allowed one to be sold before the official release date. And that actually is a legal violation because there's basically a there might a be licensing restrictions or yeah. other things yeah um you're, you're that piece i understand though it's a little heavy-handed honestly it is and particularly i mean did the person do it intentionally yeah yeah and, and then regardless of this it, it but the context really matters if her manager says go put it out there then it was fine <clears throat> which did happen here yeah and and i have a problem with this because if you have a store policy that you stock shelves even front loading it when the shelves are empty even if the start date is at a future date if that's the history again there's a cause of action here it's disparate treatment why this why now why her But they're going to lean into the, well, we're doing it across the board. Well, that still doesn't make it right. It just makes it systemically wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. It's frustrating to me because people dedicate, that person dedicated nearly 20 years of their existence. And that's how they were rewarded. Yeah. I guess I've lost target as this a... This is how you breed... Uh discontent with a yeah. store yeah exactly you know uh target has nearly 2,000 stores in the u.s and employs more than 400,000 people so there you go folks when you get up to that number you just become sociopathic and everybody is just a crop you know you okay this piece of corn is bad throw it out Sorry, you're a 19 year old piece of corn. Well, no, you're a, a 40 year old piece of corn that's been in the field for 19 years. Your, your organizational knowledge and performance metrics that have persisted for 19 years don't measure up to the $50 pink cup that you bought because it was preferential. Meanwhile, we have a Supreme Court justice that is getting cash and senators and representatives that are getting checks handed to them literally on the house floor um so i guess somebody has to have a moral compass even if it is a sociopathic driven one uh, so the next article is over at the mobile channel uh, what we think about how ancient humans ate is all wrong study suggests they didn't eat Doritos and drink Coke while and they were missing out, I guess. <laughs> hmm. I guess because I'm an AI. Ah, oh, there you go. So, and you don't drink Coke, even if you do eat Doritos. So, um, if you try a picture, if you try to picture a paleo diet, scenes of a cave person tearing hunks of animal flesh off a of bone probably come to mind. But new analysis of remains from an ancient Andean culture has revealed that these hunter gatherers mostly survived off of plants, not meat, a blow for diehard paleo gym bros everywhere. Yeah, a new study uh, published Wednesday on uh, PLOS One. Uh, researchers analyzed the chemical composition of 9,000 to 6,500 year old human bones from the Willamaya oh, Panchai, I guess. Uh, Patchai and Soro Micaya Patchai sites in Peru. I will learn how to say that so I don't flub it next time. And um, in Peru, and uh, concluded that close to 80% of these humans um, 
early humans diets were plant-based so i guess paleo means plantio i guess that's one way to put it so uh mirjam guzgan i think is how you pronounce your name correct me just send an, uh, an email to mayor at hometown.com um yeah so ancient peoples living in the andes didn't follow a now trendy paleo diet and largely ate a reserve diet of mostly vegetables oh my god can you imagine finding a culture out in that hey we found an entire society out in that no i mean it looks like a barren landscape yeah how does that happen that it doesn't something okay never mind i'm not gonna sometimes i feel like i'm a flat earther even though i'm not a flat earther <laughs> but anyway if you had Maybe talked the to me climate before the change since the time frame there you go yeah if you had talked to me before this study and asked me what i thought early human diets were in the andes mountains i would have told you confidently that it's on the order of 80 percent meat based and 20 percent plant based in fact we had it completely reversed co-author archaeologist randy haas told motherboard this is over at vice.com and just to make it abundantly clear mirjam guzgan is the author of this over at vice.com uh so yeah i guess we had it all wrong hard materials like bone or stone are preserved better than plants and simply finding these materials at a site doesn't tell researchers anything about how much meat they actually ate it's likely that the evidence for hunting has been overinflated, according to haas leaving a lot of room for interpretation and misconception so yeah i mean the 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 plants deteriorate and so for instance you can go digging into some dirt and if you find a darker dirt patch in a circle that could be a wooden post that is decomposed entirely into what appears to be darker soil but the only people that would recognize that are people that have been shown that or archaeologists and they are typically one and the same you know that so that are they circle. frequently <laughs> misinterpreting what they're finding then so well no or their it, potential for that there's potential because they see a lot of bones but there are no plant remains because plants decompose entirely into biomass whereas bones persist because of the calcium it, it all just locks in there um and so you see a lot of bones people ate a lot of animals well that's not necessarily true it's just that the bones yep. persist for a longer period of time and the animals could have been coming over to eat the plants i don't know if that's yeah i don't know it's one of those things where you go and that's what really frustrates me about historical accuracy it's based on what we know and then we discover something new and it rewrites history but the damage is already done because there are millions of people that believe this and we end up with you know accepted fact that isn't and you have to claw back the the lie or miss information and and plant the truth again and they go no 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 that's how I we was... end up with the brontosaurus yeah exactly so Haas has there several theories about why the ancient peoples might have been more plant-based one of them hunted local animals to near extinction about 9,000 years ago another is that early humans didn't hunt as much as we previously thought other studies have suggested that hunter-gatherer diet preferences can be dictated not just by food availability but also culture and in mine the way that I see it is it's a whole lot easier to gather a bunch of plants than it is to hunt down a saber-tooth you know tiger I know one reason. Hmm. The plants aren't moving around. Yeah. Yeah. They could be moving around. Or, I don't know, maybe the plants are growing in a concentrated area and you just pick the berries off. Or they actually planted, but not in such great quantities that you can consider it 
cultivation of plants, you know, farming. That's why they call them hunter gatherers. But I don't think, I, I think it's more of the gatherer. And sometimes they hunted if they happened to find something that they could trap. They need to don't... change the term to gatherer hunter. Yeah, exactly. The plantio diet instead of the paleo diet. So just one more reason uh, for us all to just start growing in our basements or in a, uh, um, a shed out back your own um, microgreens so we just we just uh, acquired all of the stuff necessary for the third farm so it's healthier you're in control of it anyway um that's it for that article so let's go on to the next one before i just kind of stall out here because i find this one really interesting so uh, the next article is over in hometown daily missouri rule change would allow senators to challenge each other to a duel um i labeled this hey, one wait a second this is new <laughs> yeah Sorry, the rule change ahead. was proposed by senator nick schroer uh schroer 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 anyway um so i labeled this section missouri politics are stuck in 1547 which was the last um accepted public uh duel so 1547 oh, there were other duels since then but i understand what you're saying yeah this is the first accepted public um or the last um accepted duel uh, others were just people murdering each other um and calling it a duel right uh, the article is over at newsweek.com. It was put together by Kate Plummer. Um, a member of Missouri Senate has proposed a rule change that if passed would allow senators to challenge each other to a duel because they're dipshits. Senator Nick Schroer, prime dipshit, put a motion to the state Senate to adopt a rule change allowing state politicians to settle grievances through physicality. No, that's called murder. That's not physicality. You want to really settle it than arm wrestle or i don't know have intellectual debate about the positives and negatives of each other's plans and <laughs> i'm sorry i was just noticing something with the ai and <laughs> oh anyway um the proposed amendment was posted on the website formerly known as twitter because the other way of saying it is stupid by Missouri Senate Democrats, it read, if Senator's honor is impugned by another Senator to the point that it is beyond repair and in order for the offended Senator to gain satisfaction. Wait, 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 I have to, let me back this up. Let me back this up. I have to read it the way that I'm actually, uh, it's being processed in my head. Okay. If a senator's honor is being impugned by another senator to the point that it is beyond repair and in order for the offended senator to gain satisfaction, such senator may rectify the perceived insult. <laughs> it's hurting my voice. <coughs> to the senator's honor by challenging the offending senator to a duel. Okay, so I thought this was going to be ridiculous, but general, but it actually says dual in the language. <laughs> like, I thought it said something like you can settle it by a physical measure, and then somebody's extrapolating that to mean, hey, it can be a dual. No, nope. oh, no, it actually says a dual. <laughs> yeah. So, prime idiot, I guess. Uh, does that mean that I... Oh, it's only two politicians. Well, I'm not a... Pol well, I am a mayor. Mayor what? I mean... Does that yeah, mean that watch Schroer out. is going to challenge me? A state, allowing state politicians. I'm not a, a state politician, but prime idiot, Senator Nick Schroer. Give me a break, dude. What is this like Congress bros now? I mean, what, what is this? It's idiocy. It's straight up idiocy. It's the lack of coping skills and the inability to communicate at any level that you have to, re, you know, resort to threatening somebody with a gun. 
We're in the 21st century for crying out loud. You know, there are children that are brighter than these idiot Congress critters of various states and federal. The trusted representative known as the second of the offended senator shall send a written challenge to the offending senator. The two senators shall agree to the terms of the duel, including choice of weapons. <laughs> this is this is like an onion article. I mean, this is really insane. Which shall be witnessed and enforced by their respective seconds. The duel shall take place in the well of the Senate at the hour of high noon on the date agreed by the parties to the duel. <laughs> Freaking idiots. Anybody that actually votes positive for this deserves to be punted from American politics because this is the stupidest nonsensical use of taxpayer dollars yeah i mean now this seems like one of these ridiculous things that they need to add like you cannot serve in a political office if you're uh legislating to be able to have a duel with your fellow legislators so i don't this even care insane. i don't care which political alignment rowden has let, let me see i don't know uh parsons is mentioned i don't know who rowden is oh on tuesday caleb rowden the leader of the missouri senate removed several members of the missouri freedom caucus formerly known as the conservative caucus from chairmanships of committees as the republican faction continued to clash with leadership and uh in a statement rowden calls the state legislative session an embarrassment so yeah well that's the freedom caucus for you um anyway he said the beginning of the 2024 legislation Senate in the se or session in the Senate had been nothing short of an embarrassment. And there's more about the politics of Missouri and the infusion of the stupid in uh, a certain party. So, yeah, willful ignorance and stupidity and bravado and machismo. And I've got to be the here's my gun. Um, you know the <laughs> well okay so like let's say a duel is actually held mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what's the outcome of this and somebody dies yeah exactly so somebody's basically committing murder murder in yeah. the senate um chamber or whatever yeah for what really amounts to 99 percent of the time politicking that doesn't impact anybody to such a great degree that it's worthy of somebody being deleted so it's just a bunch of assholes anyway let's keep going uh the next article is over in reality hacker ford recalls 1.9 million exploders i mean explorer suvs over safety issues ford has announced a recall i'm not sure why it's in reality hacker it must be because of the source must be it's weird anyway it's a safety issue that could increase the chances of a crash um ford announced a recall trevor mog over at digitaltrends.com um put the article together apparently the windshield trim panels can come off and fly into the path of other drivers so it's a, a rapid uh what do they call that a rapid disassembly unexpected disassembly or spontaneous disassembly <laughs> right Clip clips that hold the panels in place have reportedly been coming loose so ford will fix it um it affects about five percent of recalled explorers so 1.9 million explorers they're aware of 568 complaints about the issue and more than 14,000 warranty reports claiming that the parts were missing or detached all right so go get your exploder checked uh, before I go on, let me throw that into the chat. And uh, let's go on to the next one. And our last article for today is over in the continuity report. SAG-AFTRA defends Alec Baldwin. Quote, an actor's job is not to be a firearms expert. End quote. And Marwat agrees. I don't know about the AI, but... So does the AI. I've thought this whole old one story has been absolutely ridiculous. So I was glad to see this. 
So uh, some side discussion regarding this, apparently the talk about this rust um, photo I, or movie production, because I was going to say photo shoot, but that's a little too on the nose. Um, the, the whole production was wrought with issues and I, to me, the armorer, um, gained their position because of nepotism and clout. That's, that is my opinion based on what I have heard so far. Sorry, I'm trying to get my cord situated anyway. Um, so here, and here's the deal. They were the daughter of some name brand armor in history. In one of the things that I read, she asked to have live ammo brought onto the set, which they were told that is a mistake. An accident will happen. And sure as shit, an accident happened. Um, and there were other issues, right? And and the of phrase that, that raises I, a question of why that wasn't shut down then. Yeah, exactly. And and I've heard from other places I've read. You know, that it was just rife with um, basically budget people being hired, right? Like B level instead of A. And the armorer's job is to make sure that the set is safe. Why is there live ammo in any way, shape or form on the set? Where I there can't is think of any reason why there would be. Right. The only time that you could probably accept live ammo is if it's on if it's on a, a subordinate set or a stage in which it's doing a very specific type of uh, like they're cinema. trying to get a specific slow motion or something thing, and it's going to look different. Again, I hesitate to say shot, but you're trying to get a specific shot. Um. Ha and and you you just don't make that mistake you know your job as an armorer is to make sure that the set is safe so how did this actually happen sag after issued a statement thursday defending alec baldwin after the actor was indicted last week for involuntary manslaughter and the shooting death of rust cinematographer uh, helena hutchins by the way uh, he was cleared but um what do they call it um he could have he he could be charged again because there was um no oh, there wasn't double jeopardy yeah for some reason because he was he hadn't been prosecuted yet there was no double jeopardy they were building a case they were going to charge him with manslaughter or involuntary manslaughter because he was the one that pulled the trigger um and um I guess because they didn't actually have a trial, there wasn't any double jeopardy. So he's at, this is actually the second time he's being accused, indicted, I guess, um, for involuntary manslaughter. If I'm remembering all this right. That's correct. Yeah. So the union argued that Baldwin was not responsible for firearm safety and that if the pr prosecution rests on such responsibility, that is an incorrect assessment of the situation. And again, I agree. Gene Mattis over at Variety.com put the article together, um, and it and they continue. An actor's job is not to be a firearms or weapons expert. The union said performers train to perform, and they are not required or expected to be experts on guns or experienced in their use. The industry assigns that responsibility to qualified professionals who oversee their use and handling in every aspect. That's the armor. So. Um, so not only were they not checking, they were creating unsafe conditions based on what we've heard reported. Correct. Yeah. So Hannah Gutierrez read the film's armor is set to go on trial next month on separate charges of involuntary manslaughter and evidence tampering. She mistakenly loaded a live round into Baldwin's gun, which should have contained only dummy rounds. To prove involuntary manslaughter in either case, the prosecution will have to show criminal negligence, a higher standard than the ordinary negligence that would apply in a civil case. To rise to the level of criminal conduct, the behavior must be reckless, wanton, or willful, not just careless. And in this case, I think 
Um, my problem here is I think reckless is a possibility. Wanton and willful, no. But reckless, yeah. So if it is an or, right? So if it's reckless and wanton, because of the way that the, the grammar works, right? Reckless, wanton, or willful. If it's willful, then they're gonna be found guilty. If it's one of these, then they could be guilty. If it's both, I don't know. They may not have wanted this to happen right it's only one of them so there's a really good chance that reckless is going to get sustained because in at no time should there have been a commingling of ammo on the set it should not have been a, a mistake should not have been made um so in an interview with abc news in december 2021 baldwin baldwin said that he had been trained not to point again at anyone or fi and fire. Yeah. And that's, that's really the core of this. Most people who have handled uh, guns, weapons of any kind have been told if do not point them at anything you don't intend to delete. And, uh, and that's what I live by. That's what other people that have ever used them lives by. And, um, this right here is, is pretty much, you know, I, I would buy into Baldwin. Um, this is not his fault. He's the victim of somebody else's incompetence. Um, so, I, you know, unless there's some other smoking. Oh, God, I have to pause. Unless there's some other piece of paper that shows that he was aware and negligent. I don't see how he could. Um, well, I mean, How the it indictment would be, could stand. he'd almost have to be um, completely knowledgeable and then have intent, right? Right. Like, he'd almost have to know that there was live ammo. Well, of course, he wouldn't have shot it. But um. Oh, and so here it is. This is the segment where, because I have read other stuff about this um, uh, since it happened. Here's the, here's the kicker here. Gutierrez Reed did not receive any formal training as an armorer before taking the rust job, though her father, Fel Reed, is a veteran armorer. This is what got her the gig. Well, why aren't the charges against Reed? Well, Reed wasn't there. Maybe there are. Uh, no, well, okay, no, but that Reed Reed is just her dad, and no, so I her. Mean the Gutierrez Reed. Oh, there are. There's Gutierrez Reed has manslaughter charges as well. Um, it's a separate case. Baldwin, I think, should be their case should be thrown out. But it, it was the fact that dad was a veteran armorer and and nepotism, I think, is what led to that. So in a, her police interview, she said that she never saw the industry wide safety bulletins that are supposed to be attached to call sheets. Um, okay, but I'm not an armorer and I would know not to have live ammo on a movie set. Right. Like, what's the freaking point of having live ar ammo anywhere near something that an actor is using? Unless you're at a shooting range trying to get them familiar with the the, the power of a of a gun, you know? Right. Because but then you're not on the set, right? You're not even maybe using the same weapons. Right. Um, well, you should yeah. be using the same weapons. The load should be the same as the dummy round. The dummy round will have something that does exit, but it's usually not high velocity. It's just a loud, uh, as real as possible sound effect. Um, so it has the same type of load. It just doesn't have the, the bullet head. You know, it doesn't have the, the round in it, um, uh, the, the bullet. It doesn't have the damn bullet. Um, so it has uh, the shell. Um, but it, the, the casing, but it doesn't have the actual lead or whatever it is. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense. And the only thing that does make sense is that somebody pulled some strings and, and made this person. Gutierrez Reed should not have been on that set. 
No, well, also what doesn't make sense is apparently none of that was against the law before. Right? And if that is, if it hasn't been enumerated in entertainment law, um, and thus you know, all states adopting this, then that is, that's an industry failing. Um, n now it needs to be enumerated that an armorer is uh, an educated, skilled, certified armorer that's capable of following industry practices. Well, California did pass that, and I'm assuming they're the majority of the U.S.-based entertainment. Right. Um, and right up above it, it says that. California passed a law last year, though, <laughs> uh, that set training requirements for film armorers and codified... Uh, it's after set, this say, happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, all of it had been voluntary. And the reason why we have industry standards and, and safety standards and certification requirements and law that mandates it is because of stupid shit like this taking place. We can't have nice things because of idiots placing plastic bags over their heads. And now we have to have, don't place plastic bag over your head. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's the last article, but I'm going to throw it into the chat and then, uh, it will be part of the show notes over on YouTube and the podcast. Um, I, uh, hope you all get a kick out of the show and then head on over to YouTube and download it from the podcast and leave a five-star review. There is a five-star review by the way. Um, so, and, and we barely ever hype that. Uh, we don't advertise the the podcast other than here in this show and and so uh, go out tell a friend um and uh, have my undying gratitude but that's really where i'm only that legally that's where i have to stop it's just undying gratitude anyway back into the party bus so that we can drive down main street at uh the speed of a um, alec baldwin fired round and too soon always too, too soon. soon always too soon i'm sorry i'm sorry ai uh, my apologies i don't want you to be triggered anyway that's it for today i am Merwat. that's hometown.com and up there is the ai that didn't keep me out of trouble tonight you want to say bye that's an impossible task uh good night hometown citizens we will see you tomorrow at 8 p.m eastern that's right and this weekend we've got a reality hacker and the continuity report the fourth episode and uh, next weekend i will well this coming week i will have to pause the uh, hometown daily news show and next week we will probably have to pause um at least reality hacker reality hacker yeah, yeah. um just the timing is bad and uh Marwat has some mayoral duties that will um pull him away uh from but we will do what make up episodes we will cool the time machine down so that we can spend an entire week in the time chamber yikes my radiation suit can't handle it see you tomorrow everybody going to be hot in the time machine. Bye-bye.